Howdy! Welcome to the next VTS video. Honestly, I can't remember the number. <laughs> it's just... It's up there. It's in the high 50s. Not 60 yet. I think we're right at 59. And, um... Anyways, here we are. Um, after a little bit, little bit of a delay, having to relocate across the country. Um, seems to be the, the lot of the life of the animator. Traveling all over the place. Never settling down. Um... What we're in, we're into our, um, our unit on uh, cartoon animation. This is our second installment. And um, we talked about some of the basic fundamentals of what differentiates cartoon animation from more realistic or realism-based styles of animation, of which CG is generally derivative of. Uh, you know, We talked about it quite a bit last week, but the, the heritage of CG has grown out of... Uh, a strong pursuit for the expression of realism or realistic effects in rendering and that particular visual um, goal uh, throughout the technology development of CG animation and computer graphics in general for the past 25 to 30 years has informed and affected how we animate in computer graphics in such a way that the language of computer graphics animation, the visual language, and also the structural language of how we talk about things is very much couched in terms of motion realism. Um, it's gotten to the point now where the the blend between what is animated and what is not animated is very, very hard to figure out. Um, it has been getting this way for a number of years, um, but with recent um, release of the of the film Avatar, you have a fairly, a fairly significant confusion in the part of everybody as to whether or not that's an animated film. I mean, you really have to think about it. There's, there's the stretches of the film are live action, of course, but vast stretches of the film are produced and rendered and presented. They are no different than any Pixar film. Okay? They may not be completely hand keyed uh, in the motion but um, the worlds are built from scratch the models are built from scratch the textures are built from scratch the lighting is all done inside of a computer it's all computer rendered okay vast stretches of the film are computer rendered in a way that is structurally technologically and also visually very very similar to something that DreamWorks would make Blue Sky would make Pixar would make ad infinitum. So Avatar, the only really driving thing about it is that the motion in Avatar was based or derivative off of motion capture. Now, the thing about motion capture is, you know, 10 years ago, there was a fairly significant debate in the animator community that motion capture was going to steal our jobs. Well, I didn't look at it in terms of stealing our jobs, but it certainly could take a lot of the fun out of the job. Um, the thing is, in motion capture, you know, there's always, it's a starting point, and um, but even then, they, the the whole goal of motion capture is to try and get it so that you need no animators, all right? They don't want that because there's a there's a war between who owns the performance, okay? Uh, in motion capture, the goal of the director, and generally for these kinds of things, James Cameron and also Richard Zemeck. Um, Robert Zemeckis, is that his name? Yeah, I don't know. The guy did uh, Polar Express and Forrest Gump and all that stuff. What they want is they want this, they want the actor to own the performance. Okay? And this is really where it gets down to. Is the performance is owned by the, the live actor. Sigourney Weaver, whoever you want it to be. Tom Hanks. This is the person who they want to own the performance. They want their acting, they want their body motion, they want their facial expressions captured, interpreted, and expressed in a completely rendered CG world, okay? The the recent uh, uh, Christmas Carol movie that Jim Carrey did, similar thing. Again, completely 100% digitally rendered in every respect except in motion, it is the same as any other Pixar, Blue Sky, you know, big CG production. So what we have is a continual drive for the actor to own the performance. The only limiting factor keeping this from being completely true is the technology. 
And as we all know, the technology is getting better and better and better. And the technicians who run the technology are getting smarter and more clever about how to use it. Um, I currently have the privilege of working with uh, a really, really bright fellow, Jeff Uday, who was the uh, facial animation kind of guy, you know, who kind of really established the system of how the facial animation work was going to be done uh, on the film Avatar, where they're going to take the mocap facial data and then apply it across these, you know, CG puppets or actors or whatever you want to call them, and that whole system tried as much as possible to remove out of the equation, uh, you know, the work of, you know, animators. Now, you still needed people to clean the stuff up, push it, and all that other stuff. But that's a that's a style choice. It's not necessarily a, a choice that is required to get the stuff in there. And as time goes by, the technology is going to come where we won't really need a lot of handwork. The, it's just going to get better. It's just the reality. So having said that, this is this is where the natural progression of the whole CG movement goes. And CG, like I said, is a language. Uh, it, we talk about terms of um, what what I say are parts, but the difference for cartoon animation is is a focus on shapes. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, in computer animation, we we deal a lot of times. And the way it's cur currently done is we talk in terms of parts. The feedback we give to one another is like, well, the hand is doing this, or, okay, well, the head's doing this, or the hips need to do this, or the feet need to do that, or there's some weight that needs to happen here. And we start talking in terms of what body part is causing the hitch or the problem, and we, and we, foc we focus ourselves on these specific pieces and what these specific pieces are doing and how they can be cleaned up and moved. So we track the arcs of the hand. We track the arcs of the nose. We track the, the path of travel of the hips. We track the overlap um, on you know the, the fingers or on the arms or on the legs or on the torso. We, we're always talking about parts. Okay, um, That is a very mechanical, very technical outside way of looking at uh, how to how to do animation because if you're always talking about parts you, what you're doing is you're breaking the whole down into pieces okay one of the we very rarely think in terms um, you know of, of CG animation and looking at shapes we think in terms of parts it's just again the way it is They're, the characters are modeled with parts they're rigged with parts their controls are on parts uh, we have discrete and total control over each part so that, you know, this is what we do. We break the, the whole down into pieces. Well, one of the problems is it's difficult to keep in mind the whole. You know, we're always looking at these parts. And then as time goes by, we get finer and finer control and skill over what we call the details. Okay, well, basically, all concepts, I mean, all, all conversation about control of details is really just about controlling ever smaller parts. Right? I remember the first uh, lecture I went to that was really focused on details. It was um, Andrew Gordon, uh, Pixar animator, very bright guy, talented guy, good guy, great animator. Um, he was giving a conversation in Dallas about um, his work on um, uh, Wazowski in Monsters, Inc., and talked about how he studied the blink, and all the details are going to blink, because basically Wazowski was just this big eye, right? And so, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be able to, you know, understand how to express that character with this big giant eye, so he studied details about how blinks work. But when the when as he was going into it, what was really happening was he was talking about ever finer parts about what made up the eye and all the things that go into the eye and how it moves and all these all these things and it was just basically breaking the hole down to smaller and smaller and smaller parts to track to move to offset to to work with and it's it's good to study that because we have the we have the control over that level of granularity and fidelity with CG characters um, but 
that's if you're going for that realism outgrowth style of motion. Um, 2D animation generally has not f focused anywhere near as much on parts. In fact, classic, you know, golden era cartoon animation was more about shapes. Um, I, for the purposes of avoiding lawyers, nasty grams, and stuff like that, I don't show uh, examples the, in uh, from other cartoons in these videos because I don't feel like having, like I said, I don't feel like having lawyers write me nasty letters telling me they're going to sue me for using copyright stuff. So, but I will give you a list of some things to check out. Check out the Dover Boys. Okay, this is a Warner Brothers short by Chuck Jones. Alright, you could probably find it online if you want. YouTube's a great resource for this stuff because even though it's copyrighted, people put it up. You know, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying, look for it. I'm sure it's there. If not, if you want to find it um, in a DVD package, which is good to do frame scrubbing, if you want to study it frame by frame, which is really the best way to study this stuff, to be honest with you, is get it off the uh, the Looney Tunes um, Volume 1 collection. And what you're going to find is that this was a short done in the late 30s, early 40s, probably you know, right on the cusp there, somewhere maybe 1940. Um, where Jones just studied the power of shapes and motion. When he moved a character from one part of the world to another part of the world in his cartoon, he did not concern himself with the mechanics of body parts. Okay, In CG, when we move from A to B, we're this entire distance we are concerned primarily, almost exclusively, and almost blindly, the mechanics of part locomotion. That's what we do. We study this stuff. Footfalls, legs, weight, arm swing, head overlap, all these things. The, it's just studying the mechanics of parts in locomotion. All right, that's it. Jones did something completely different. He said, I don't care about the mechanics of parts in motion. I care about the feel or the impression of shapes. Now, I'll give you a really, really quick example of this and kind of draw it out. You have a sphere that starts here and it ends over here. Now, you could have it just travel from here to here. A nice, you know, spacing is tight right here and have it kind of ease out, go a little faster and then a little bit slower and come in and you can show that. Okay? And you can do it in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, 10 frames, 11 frames, whatever. And it would have a nice slow, fast, slow kind of feel to it. And you could put an arc on it. It would be very nice and we can do that in CG in our sleep. We do this all the time. But with the, the classic cartoon animation, what they did is they have a sphere here or you know a ball here a, bar, a ball there it would start by stretching just a little bit on one frame and then the next frame it would really stretch out and then the third frame or whatever it would kind of get the end there and kind of kind of stretch itself in there and then the last one it would be finally a sphere in shape now uh, that's actually not a very good example because this is pointing this way and it doesn't flow nice. So if they were going to get a sphere from or a ball from here to here, but they wanted it to look interesting, the very first frame would probably stretch away like this and then the next one, we'll do something we can see, would try to actually get a lot of the the, the arc of the motion would be in the shape itself. And then the the other drawing would be like this and then we finally we would end up with the ball over here. So what you what you had then was the drawings were con totally concerned about not the mechanics of parts in motion but the impression of shapes. not in motion but in transition okay because it's a different kind of word right 
the shapes are shifting, they're changing, they're getting from A to B, but they're doing so in a way that gives the impression or the feeling, the idea of, ex of motion being expressed, but it's not necessarily motion being defined as we see it in the world around us. It's a very impressionistic approach, okay? In your pre-Raphaelite uh, era painters, your classic painters, uh, and you know, coming out of the Renaissance, the you know the the focus was very much on realism in painting. Okay, and then along come these dudes in France, probably smoking some weed or doing something. I don't know. Van Gogh was nuts, but you know, you got these guys who are all of a sudden aren't really interested in representing every little detail of of life around them as they see it, but rather trying to capture the impression of life around them. So they would try and just give the impression with paint of what light playing on trees looks like as it feels, not the specifics of how it looks down to the finest details like the you know painters of the 1700s would, but just the idea, just the, the wash over feel. Well, that's very much what shapes in motion are all about. Um, shapes in motion are all about the feeling that you get of something moving. And so the Dover voice is a great example of that. What, that's an extreme example of it. Um, what you find is then once you see something like the Dover boys, take a look at pretty much any 1940s era Disney, MGM, Walter Lance, um, and Warner Brothers cartoon. You could also throw in stuff like Terry Tunes, which are usually not as well executed, but there's some pretty crazy stuff in there too. Take a look at anything from 19, pretty much through the 1940s. Once you start getting in the 1950s, budget constraints become a problem. Um, you're seeing people experiment with more limited animation, meaning fewer drawings. Uh, you start getting into the UPA stuff, and um, as, as fun and neat as that is in in art and modern art and expression of it, the shapes become less flexible in UPA type stuff. Um, the overall design of characters is far more impressionistic, but their motion se somehow seem to get lost. I think it's because motion is a very expensive thing to come up with. Everybody's always trying to come up with a way to get motion cheaper. So, uh, But once you see the Dover Boys, study any of these things. All right, now, does that mean that none of this stuff can be done in CG? No, that's not necessarily true. Because um, a really great example of a studio today that is exploring some of these concepts and ideas is Blue Sky. Uh, there, and if, if you look at um, their film Horton Hears a Who, uh, you know, story-wise, I didn't think a whole lot of it. And Jim Carrey is a shtick that I personally find annoying. But... Um, if you just look at the animation, just look at the motion, try and you know pick a shot. There's a lot of them in there that have these shapes and motion concepts, where the that you can tell the animator is very concerned about how something moves from point A to point B, and not so much in the mechanics of the pieces, but in that transition somewhere in the middle there. They're worried about, they're concerned, they really lock in and try to polish it up so that you get this sense of shape changing not parts moving uh, it, not every scene and not every character is to that level but there are a number of them in the film that are actually very very well done um, and I think in that sense we we can find real success to see that the concept works um, they're not mixing up frame ranges at all meaning they're doing everything on ones so it's highly polished it's also very tedious work to do that. You know, uh, the 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 goofier the rig, the harder it is to do. It takes a lot of work, but it, the look is really, really a, uh, successful and attractive. So you can do it. Um, you know, just getting back to you know, so getting back into Maya. Well, how would we how would we do something like that? Um, well, one of the things we can do is here. I'll just even open up the scene. You guys, watch me. Okay, so what we have is, you know, this is an example of my auto character. What I wanted to do here is um, kind of show you, let's focus on this hand. 
it, where I was really concerned about the sense I wanted this shape to, to flow and give an impression of it whipping around. So what I did here is I just kind of went through and crafted what this arm shape was going to be like across a couple of frames. And you see right here, I tried to keep it playing away from this thing right here. Now it's all kind of jumbled right there, but if I pull that away, you can start to see how I wanted the shapes to kind of do something really, really cool to give an impression of the whole thing just doing this. All right, and that was really it. It was not about the mechanics because I mean, there's just there's no there's no way to explain the mechanics too well of a lot of that stuff. Um, There's some other other frames here where this could work, like right here as well. As the as the hand pulls away, I very much concern myself with, you know, the shapes as they pulled away. Notice that I'm working from the point right here with the hand. So I'm taking and I'm transitioning from this kind of a shape into that kind of a shape. And notice it comes up here in the origin for the final shape is up there. So you can see that there's a lot of attention paid to just how these shapes flow and how they work together. Again, if I hide it, you can you can really see how that could kind of work together and, and it's all very very conscientiously mindful of where the shape attaches to the body and how it can work its way through and I'm trying to create the impression of a sense of motion like that and it's pretty much there I mean this th there's no there's no section of it right in through here and that's that's rendered because it's not in between but it's implied and so you buy it you know this whole notion of it kinda just working its way up there and so you can do this the the rigs oftentimes require quite a bit of work to make it work that way but there's a lot to be said for this approach because it's something that's again more visceral it's more um, impressionistic it's it's a focus more on just the shapes and how the shapes transition in space um, like for instance if I just use his overall body as an example we have this kind of reversed gumball shape right here very very simplistic shape and as he pulls away I'm trying to create a basic impression of a smear or of a of you know just this real simple progression much like the sphere that I drew earlier where it's kinda kinda deforming its way through the path and very much kind of implying how it's just becoming this squashed jelly bean shape and just kind of pops up here now that's a fairly significant transition right there and this is the blocking sage of this scene so a lot of the a lot of the fluff is taken out but you can see that if you were kind of draw the overall impression of the shape and motion you can see there's an arc in there and then you get this sense of motion to it where you know you really get an idea that he's scooping down underneath and coming up all from the shapes transitioning and I, I didn't really concern myself with the you know okay was well, the hips doing this or are the shoulders doing that or the head doing this it was those weren't even part of the conversation in my mind the whole thing was like is this shape flowing from this one to the next one to the next one does that whole progression work um, and is it is it functioning in a way to give the impression of this swooping smear just like if you just you know that's what motion blur is all about really what this is doing is it's just approximating when something moves quickly in our in our field of view we really can't pick up the minute notions of it in computer graphics we rely on a cinematic realistic world representation of this with motion blur okay motion blur is a is an artifact that we see in the real world around us and and at times it's captured on camera 
so well naturally again CG's realism goal causes us to use that as the example but before motion blur in camera what they did was this stuff right here this is approximating the impression of something moving so quickly from point A to point B that you just get a sense of it of its volume from here to here you get a sense of how it's moving you get a sense a feeling uh, an energy but and that's that's really the thing the difference is that this kind of animation is so much more about energy you know how do things feel than it is about mechanics um, and and so it's it's another good example of um, a scene that just you know needed different kind of energy than mechanics and was about shapes it was a an APT student that I had Anand Kumar who was very talented and he was doing a cartoon animation he was trying to study how to do it in CG and at the time I was myself learning a lot about it and so we were exploring this kind of together and it was really neat because he wanted to do a character just standing and then getting surprised doing a big take and then ending up in the air with his legs all straightened out and his arms all and his eyes all bug out you know he wanted to do a nice big Tom and Jerry or uh, you know Tex Avery type take and as he was working through it he blocked out the standing he he blocked out the compression of the of the anticipation for the take and he blocked out um, the character in the air but the transition from the one the from the anticipation pose where he was down here and his head was down and his and his arms were up okay and he's all bent over alright so you got this character who's all bent over and he's doing this in CG I don't have the scene right in front of me because um, I want to draw through it and explain it and then what he did to get from here to the character up is he was starting to he worked out the mechanics of the parts so he had this thing where the character was kind of pushing up off the ground his, and it was nicely done his head's dragging and stuff like that and his his arms are starting to come down a little bit and he's starting to uncurl and the the one leg is raised up a little bit and the other one is pushed off from the ground and so he's just trying to do this whole you know progression of jumping thing and this is in CG this is what we do but the thing here is he's concerning himself with the mechanics of parts in locomotion and so he was thinking well okay if I'm gonna jump and every every single animation book and and program and and tutorial out there for the past 10 years has said think about this stuff film video of yourself doing it plan it out what's gonna do this what's gonna lead you know the hips gonna lead then what is the foot gonna do and if you're gonna animate in that style absolutely you have to do that because it's what that style requires but for a cartoon style that's death that's like the worst thing you can do it's like crazy but it's one of the worst things you can do because what you'll end up doing is recreating the mechanics of motion and you're not gonna catch the energy okay so the energy of the scene was a guy explosively having this big take being so surprised or so scared or whatever that he just explodes in this big giant expression in the air and then he scrambles so much that he just gets out of there really fast so the energy is about a big surprise a massive reaction overreaction and a quick exit okay that's what the energy was about the the animation needed to reflect that and um, let me kind of dig that up. I'll dig up the movie for you here in just a second. Okay, so here's the scene. The guy's standing. Now this is this is all done on one, so it's highly you know it's highly polished through. There's no mixing of frame rates here. It's not you know holding things on twos. But you see, he's kind of going from here to here, and here's his anticipation pose, and he has a nice little moving hold into it. But you notice what we discovered was him doing the mechanics of the character standing totally didn't work so I said how about this the idea here is we're going from a stretch shape and we're going into a squashed shape and then we want to come up here into a big exploded shape but let's think of this guy in terms of him being a piece of fireworks okay well fireworks 
get shot up into the sky and then they explode in the sky. They don't explode on the way up to the sky. They get shot into the sky and then explode. So what I suggested to Anand at the time was let's just shoot him up like some fireworks and then have him explode. And when you watch it, it totally works. The other way, it took too long. It w even though he was taking only three, maybe five frames to get the character up, it sucked all the life out, all the energy out of it. That big pop, that, that just big boom was lost. And it became this kind of nicely animated, well polished. Even he had he had a good eye for detail in a lot of areas, but it just lacked that zip to it. It lacked the sense of energy that we're looking for because he was looking too much in the mechanics and not enough in terms of the shape. Um, and it's a great it was a huge lesson for both of us, but for me especially, because um, I really came to understand what it was that was the differentiating value between cartoon animation and, and more realistic styles. Um, there's uh, another scene that he did, which was this one, was also on my blog for a while there. And this one's a dialogue piece. And it starts off very subtle. But you see right here, he, got, he even got into the character and started pulling things. The head, you see... He's trying to have it give an impression of smearing itself from point A to point B. So it gets there. All right, and you see that the the head is very much about shapes and motion. And the same thing with the hand here. You notice that this hand is kind of dragged back and this one's dragged back this way because he's trying to give the impression of these things kind of unfolding out, you know coming from something big to something big and so he's stretching it and it's it's really more you know it's not even so much about oh you know overlap this or drag that it's really just trying to draw a picture of motion that goes this way and but he does it in a, in a way that you can still sense where it came from and where it's going to and that's really key when we're talking about shapes and motion we the the transition shape needs to show us two things at the same time which is very different than how we do things with typical in-betweens it needs to show us where it came from and where it's going to at the same moment without necessarily being in either place okay it is the past and the future compressed into one single moment and it's really that's really the the interesting thing about this entire technique because it comes from here and it ends up here but this in between needs to show us somehow the past the present and the future all at the same time if you can think of it that way so anytime you're working on these shapes in transition you have to say okay does this shape show me somehow where this thing came from does it show me where it is now? Well, of course, you know, if you if you put this little arc into it, you know, uh, the implied idea is that somewhere in here, if it was moving a little bit slower, it would be somewhere right around in here, but it's moving so fast, we can't see every distinct, unique position. So all we can do is get a sense of all of them smushed together. It's the compression of time into one single, one single shape that shows you where it came from, where it's going to, and where it is all at the same time. And that's really kind of the core of it when you get right down to it. Here's another example. This one's from uh, Sonny Carbana, another, another uh, probably you know one of my favorite students. And he's doing a lot of personal expressions and, and studies in uh, cartoon animation and shapes and motion himself. And he does the same sort of thing here where he's trying to give a sense of the character starting here and ending up here, not only is he doing a shift in space, but he's also doing a shift in size. And he wanted it to feel like that. So that in-between shape needs to show somehow a little bit of where it, is, where it was going, where it was, and where it is at that time. And so this in-between captures it pretty well. Um, as we talked about it, it could be a little bit stronger if this hand actually you know, was kind of up this way, even though that's not where it was going. You, you don't worry about 
where's the hand going from point A to point B? You you worry more about where's the overall share character silhouette and shape, and where's the character silhouette and shape going there. So you create leading trails, trailing trails. It's all about driving the eye to follow the shape, not necessarily about specific body parts. So as the hand was going that way, he kind of dragged it down because that's what we do when we animate parts in motion. We kind of drag them. But what would have been better is if that hand had actually been turned up so that it can point, this this little blurry shape right here can point up to where it's going. That would have been stronger. If this elbow were tucked in a little bit more, it could it could define the travel of the head along that path pretty well. But, you know, this was like, this was indeed his first re real push into the into the cartoon stuff and but you see that the you have to pay no less attention to the animation when you're doing cartoon stuff it's not like oh cartoon stuff doesn't matter you know it's easy you just kind of slop it in here and it's not as de it's not as detailed it's extremely detailed it's just that you have to think completely different about what the details are about you can't be sloppy with your controls in fact you have to have tighter control over your character in, especially in CG with this that I think even with some of the more detailed realistic work uh, I, it all requires a great level of control and concentration about what each part is doing in in its service and in, in the the motion of of parts you have to worry about these things to the finest detail because you don't want distracting pieces of motion you don't want lack of weight you know you want the mechanics to feel right but for cartoon animation you really have to think in terms like I said about that where it's been where's it going where is it now that whole expression of the entire thing and one little thing and and do it for each of these in-betweens now some of them you know this is probably the most successful of his in-betweens the other ones could be a little bit stronger but I show it to you just to kind of show you that even only accomplishing it roughly and he's he is relying relying on um, motion blur to do it but he didn't really need to because this would this worked without it actually but the nice thing here is you see he's being really smart he's working from this particular silhouette this is what he wants to kind of show right that's where he was and this is where he's going so with a little bit of a something right there okay but that, to me that's kind of a secondary piece so I don't really worry about it but you'll notice he does a really nice job here kind of showing where he was and where he's going where he is there he's doing okay but this is really neat notice this hand dragging back there what he's trying to do is maintain and again this would have been actually a little bit stronger had it gone up just a little bit and kind of tied into this original shape just a little bit more. So if he had tucked this hand with the doll in it back here and put it in that shape right there, you know, put it in that position, um, you know, somewhere around there, instead of being that mass being there, which is pretty good, but if he had put it there, it would have been great because it would have been in that line of where he was and where he's going. You see that? It would have drawn that connection and so you, what you try to do for every single in-between is you really work on how the shapes flow from one to the next to the next to continue that concept of where, where, where have I been, where am I going, and where am I all the time, every in-between, make that connection. And it's, that's, again, I repeat it a bunch because it's, it's the core of it. You know, where was it? Where is it? And where is it going? So if you want to know what three things are important to show in your breakdowns and your in-betweens for these shape-based animation, this classic cartoon style animation, don't think in terms of, oh, the hand goes here, or the arm moves like that, or the leg moves like this, or the torso bends like this. That's more realism-based style. What we're talking about here is, 
these three things every drawing or frame for you know if you don't want to say drawing every frame of every in between for the move needs to have some element of all these things and the more control you have over it the better it is and so it's a lot of focus on these these very detailed specifics um, uh, you know getting back to this piece right here you see it he's he's down here bent over like so so that's where he's where he was and then he's coming up here as a kind of upper anticipation all right so he's coming up here so his in-betweens for this all need to express where he was where he's going and where he is pretty successful although if he had tilted his head to angle more like that it would have helped um, but it's pretty good because it's showing where it came from, where it's going, and kind of where it is. Same. All right. So that's kind of a pose there. Now what he's going to do is go from that into this. Okay, so when he's over here, the general shape is kind of like that. So all the in-betweens from here to here, as much as possible, should show that where he was, where he's going, and where he is. And you see they're pretty successful. When, and if you look at it, kind of get rid of some of this stuff, he's using parts of the body to sell that. Like this hand is kind of dragging behind. You see that? But he's using that hand as a way of saying, this is kind of the cue to say, this is where I was. And notice how he's using this hand here to lead your eye to where he's going. Because watch where his head ends up. In that drawing right there, that one frame. Again, it could be a little bit tighter on the control if the fingers had kind of curled up in there and if this hand were positioned more over here. You know, so if on this drawing, this hand were over a little bit more and this one kind of curled his fingers up there. But you notice, look at this. He's even drawing with the head. The, the head is making this connection. All right, he's the foot is dragging behind, the body is dragging, the whole thing, it's a shape. It, it, bodies don't move like this, okay? Heads don't squash like that, arms, it's very rare to get somebody who moves like this, but this move works because of this one frame. If this one frame isn't this strong, the whole thing doesn't work. It, it really is, that's like the linchpin, that's the one that really holds the whole bridge up. And it's really, it's like a bridge. These, these shape drawings are like bridges. You get from here to here, and you have to show the beginning, the middle, the end, and all that business. And it's got to be tight, and you got to understand exactly what you're doing with it. Um, and it's very successful. The whole impression is there. The cool thing about it is, and you see this with the Dover Boys especially, um, when you approach animation this way, your sense of timing becomes far more loose than um, realism because there are certain things you know in a more realistic style when something moves too fast or moves too slow we feel it you know like it really looks wrong it looks like there's it's the 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 necessity for exactitude is very high it's got to be just right there with this you can do something very very fast I mean could you get from I'm not even sure what frame he's at here, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Half a second. In real life, if we animated this guy in a more realistic sense from here to here in half a second, I mean, we could do it. Yeah, we could do it. But the mechanics of it, it wouldn't have the energy because really he's hitting two poses. He's getting that one and then that one right there. But just the freedom he has to make this move right here in one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, that's a quarter of a second. From there to there in a quarter of a second, you can get away with a lot faster motion, but it has to be you have to be smart. If your if your shapes, if this is wrong, if this drawing right here isn't as controlled as it is, 
then it will pop. And it's very important that we don't want popping. Popping is when we see something moving very fast, but the shapes aren't working. The shapes don't line up. They're not transitioning from one shape to the next shape to the next shape with a sense of smoothness. Um, and, you know, this pops a little bit because he could have had tighter control over a couple of things like you know that hands pretty good to control you know all of it's actually pretty well controlled this could have arced out a little bit more right there but there's only a few places where it could have been just a little tighter but in general it totally works and it doesn't pop hardly at all I mean all of it just totally flows totally works and it's there because he pays attention to the shapes. So again, here he's going from a stretch shape, and he wants to go to a squash shape down here, and then he's kind of, you know, see how he's he's not, you know, that. If you look at that drawing, it looks like it has no weight whatsoever. You know, you're like that's not how bodies move. Never mind the head squishing. Just look at just the mechanics of. There, you know, where's the push off? There's no push off there. There's nothing. There's not another frame down there for him to kind of get the weight and get the mechanics of the leg pushing, and then this one leading and this one pushing off. There's no time for it. But he just kind of comes up here into another big stretch shape, and it totally works. Okay, so you got a big stretch shape right here. But it's kind of. It's not even a stretch shape. It's kind of just a. Comp it's it's a bigger shape but it's sort of compressed and then here he's gonna stretch out again big stretch out shape and he's gonna hit another compression right down here so you notice how he's playing with squash and stretch a ton ton of squash and stretch it's all about the overall silhouette expanding and contracting expanding and contracting and the energy is there you don't feel that this has no weight if this were slower I mean if he took three frames to do this move instead of the one that he does right here it would feel wrong okay it would it need it would need more time it would need more detail in the mechanics of the body parts and stuff but as you watch it it works. It's got it's got the weight it needs to kind of swing down and pop up in the air because it's all about the energy of him swinging it up in there. It doesn't need to. St if it stayed down here longer, it would suck all the energy out of it, and it wouldn't work. And it's really just understanding how these shapes transition. So these movies are included for you guys to kind of pick through, and. And as a as a exercise for yourself, just go through like I'm doing and just kind of trace the shapes and try and see how they blend together and how one fits into the shape of the other, fits into the next one, fits into the next one. And if you pull one off or if you do one that's a little bit, you know, if you take that and you just move it off, you'll see that there's a hitch right there. Uh, you know, I'll just give you a simple example of that. If the shapes are kind of you know, smearing into themselves, but then we have a weird one. Okay, well, that's what a hitch is. That right there. But if we make that like that, you see, it all flows together. So th they kind of have to just, and it, the level of exactitude, I mean, the higher that you have control over this stuff, the smoother this goes, the less hitchy it is. But there's some room for for playing around here. Now the question you may ask yourself is, well, hey, I don't have a rig that can do all these things. Well, the Moom rig that we're using on these things is free. Go ahead and use it. You can do all those things. Um, you can get it at a high-end 3D or called Creative Crash now or something. But um, you can you can do this even with a rigid rig that doesn't have any deformation controls other than your basic stick figure mechanics. You can do this with anything. It's just a way of thinking about how the pieces move and how you're creating these shapes with the overall silhouette of the character. It, you know, it, this is not a rigging thing. This is an animation thing. Okay, 
we can do things in the rigs to make it easier to accomplish this or give us a wider range of things we can do but the core idea here you can do it with the simplest stick figure stiff rig you can do it I know because I've done it all right so the ideas are there you just you have to think in terms of the, the shapes and how they play and how they move okay so I've kind of beat on that horse quite a bit I've tried to talk about it come at it from about three different angles hopefully one of them was one that lodged in your mind and said okay I get it some the best the best thing you can do is practice get a ball to form the ball get the care the moon character okay I mean he's it's a great little rig I love that rig it's M O O M all right you can get it for free um, you know uh, and I, I even forgot who made it it's terrible of me I use it so much but you know get it email the guy who made it tell him it's a great rig it's it's a and it is for just mess around and stuff no it's not a, a film rig but it's actually better than a lot of film rigs I've used film rigs are over engineered in a lot of ways but this is real fast it's fresh it's simple it's interactive it's fun and it gives you the ability to kinda create some broader range of shapes but it's not limiting it's not limiting your ability to, to discover this if you use a, a rig like Norman or Alfred or the other good rigs that are out there, the Andy rig. You can do all of these same things with these stiffer rigs. When I say stiffer, I mean ones that don't have the ability to kind of make the arm into an S shape or pull and stretch the head and stuff like that. It can still work. It's all about the silhouettes and how they move together. Okay? Um, and hopefully that was something that was useful and enlightening to you. And check out those examples. And I think, uh, you know, do your homework. It's, none of this stuff comes to you without doing the homework. you got to study it. you got to frame through it. And don't just watch it and enjoy it and say, well, that's really cool. Really get in there and ask yourself the question, why did that animator decide to do that? Okay, especially with the hand-drawn stuff, especially with the Dover Boys. This is 1940. I mean, this Geez, 70 years ago, these guys are sitting down. Why did they decide that would work? That's a great question. Ask yourself that. Dig into it. Think about it. Think, well, how do they see motion to make that choice? And you're going to find that, whoa, I don't see motion the same way. I know I did. It was like a, whoo. Hopefully you guys catch on to it faster than I did. All right, so there you go. Until next time, be good. God bless.